Hey, how's it going? <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I hope you've had a good time. I didn't have such a good time. I spent uh, nine and a half weeks in prison here in Ukraine. Uh, I've been out on bail since uh, July 6th. Today is July 31st. And to prove the time, um, uh, I just checked on my, uh, on my subscription, Defense Politics Asia, which is a pretty good channel, uh, put out, just put out a video called uh, Niger on the Brink of Regional War. That should prove the, the time that I'm recording this video. Mm -hmm. Now, um, at the same time that I'm posting this video, I'm posting a long thread on my Twitter account. My Twitter account is Gonzalo Lira 1968. Gonzalo Lira 1968, one word, all together. And uh, in that, I discuss what has happened to me over the past three months uh, in some detail. I also include the, um, the indictment against me uh, that, um, that I'm going to be tried on. Um, I'm going to be tried on Wednesday, August 2nd, the day after tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Um, I posted both the original Ukraine language version and the uh, translation. The translation was by the court-appointed translator, so I have no idea if it's accurate or not. Those who, of you who speak Ukraine will be able to uh, give a better sense as to whether that, um, that translation is accurate, but that's besides the point. I put up the entire indictment in both the original and the translation so that you can see exactly what I was charged with and imprisoned for. Now, the charges are very serious because the penalty is five to eight years in a prison labor camp. I'm 55 years old, mm -hmm. and some of you may know I have a fairly serious heart condition. I'm not going to survive five to eight years. And I've already been told uh, by uh, people who would know that I will be found guilty. And because of circumstances, um, it would be convenient for me to serve out that sentence, for me to basically disappear. Mm -hmm disappear in a prison labor camp and, um, you know, potentially die there, you know, either naturally or unnaturally, as the case may be. Now, in the tweet thread, I go into more or less what happened. I composed that tweet thread uh, last night. It took me two hours to do it because there was a lot of information and, uh, you know, keeping it to 25 tweets, you know, it's tough. But anyway, the upshot is that I was accused of um, being a pro-Russian propagandist, and basically, you know, I mean, th cut through the legalese, it was basically that. Uh, I was also accused of denying the Russian invasion, which is laughable. I mean, I've always said that the Russians invaded. It's self-evident, you know. I never denied that fact. Uh, they said that I was justifying this invasion that was unprovoked, and of course, we all know that it was provoked. It didn't come out of the blue. It wasn't that the Russians one day decided, hey, let's just invade Ukraine. No, it was provoked, and I gave a very detailed explanation as to why it was provoked in a video that really chapped the ass of the prosecutor's office, apparently. The video of mine called uh, Ukraine a Primer, which of course goes into the backstory and the history of relations between these two countries and why they uh, wound up going to war as they are currently embroiled in. So anyway, um, the point is, I'm going to be found guilty. And because of things that happened, corruption and extortion that happened in prison against me, uh, I will be found guilty. I will not get a suspended sentence. I will have to serve out my term and likely die in, in this prison labor camp. Hmm, shut. Sorry, hang on. Hmm, sorry about that. I don't have three hands. Anyway, um, so realizing that my court date is the day after tomorrow, and realizing some other information that was quite strange, I was granted bail after innumerable hurdles because when I was originally arrested, I was um, nominally supposed to get 
a lawyer, have access to a lawyer, be able to call my loved ones and arrange for bail. Now, insofar as lawyers, I have lawyers up the wazoo. Insofar as loved ones, not as many as lawyers, but I have quite a few that I care about very deeply, most especially my small children. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have two children, Veronica, who is 10, she just turned 10. She turned 10 while I was in prison, and my son, Ramon, who is eight. And of course, I wanted to talk to them, but I was not allowed to speak to them during the entirety of my stay in prison. Um, and of course, I wasn't allowed to post bail, even though I had the means to post bail. Now, let me explain that situation, which is very interesting. You see, nominally, on the first day that I was arrested, I could have posted bail, but I was not given the opportunity to do so, to contact the people who would have the cash available to post my bail. And it wasn't that much, it was $11,000, which I, I, I don't want to sound arrogant, $11,000 is quite a bit of money for most people. I am blessed by the good fortune of having the means to put together that kind of money at a moment's notice, and so I could have posted bail on the very first day, but the authorities simply didn't allow me to do it, even though they said I could. Mm -hmm. Now, I was imprisoned uh, briefly for two nights. I was in interrogatory prison number one, that's the name of it. And then uh, after that, I spent the remaining nine weeks, exactly nine weeks, in CISO prison, which is also an investigative prison. And that is a prison where uh, individuals who have been accused of a crime are held while their case is investigated by either the police or the SBU who has arrested them. The SBU, for those of you who don't know, is the uh, State Security Services of Ukraine. They are basically the, um, the, the, the uh, descendants of the KGB, okay? Uh, so anyway, um, I wasn't allowed to post bail and it was only through fairly heroic measures and a lot of uh, uh, um, pressure, political pressure from the government of Chile and apparently the State Department as well because they um, didn't seem to like the fact that I wasn't being allowed to post bail. I spoke with representatives of the U.S. Embassy uh, three times during the nine weeks I was there. Um, and uh, they, they didn't, they, they just gave me bromides. They made no effort to uh, pull me out, you know. I mean, if only I'd been a black lesbian druggie or a transgender grifter, then maybe they would have done something. Well, no, if I'd been one of those two things, I would have been out instantly. But of course, since I'm not, yeah, and since, uh, a couple of people who would know have told me that Vicky Newland actually knows about me and hates my guts. So there you go. So anyway, the point is, um, there was the appearance of unfairness, so eventually I was allowed to post bail. But the bail conditions were very interesting because um, I had to surrender my passports. I had to wear an electronic monitor. Um, I wasn't allowed to leave the city of Kharkov or the country. Mm -hmm. And they also confiscated, of course, um, all of my computers, my iPad, my uh, iPhone. Uh, they also confiscated uh, about $9,000 that I had as emergency cash, you know. You know, the kind of cash you have around just in case of anything. Well, they confiscated that. and. Um, and they confiscated a bunch of uh, my documents, specifically my uh, driver's license, my Chilean identity card, and the registration cards for my motorcycles. I don't own a car, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so I was told in no uncertain terms that I had to stay in Kharkov and um, not leave the city under any circumstances, and of course not leave the country, and I would get these, this ankle monitor and I would get, uh, I would have to surrender my passports. But when I posted bail and was released, uh, I was, my passports were returned to me. I didn't get any kind of ankle monitor. And a few days later, I went to the SBU offices of the um, investigator who had, uh, you know, investigated my case. And he returned my driver's license my Chilean ID card and uh, my registration documents for my motorcycles. Mm -hmm. 
as you can see, there's my bike. I don't know if you can see it properly. There you go. And so this was very interesting to me. Now, last year I was, um, I was detained by the SBU, uh, also for videos that were very critical of what was going on. And um, they investigated me because they thought, curiously enough, that I was some sort of Russian agent. Okay, of course, I'm not a Russian agent, you know. And um, I'm just a regular guy living in Ukraine who saw what was happening, was horrified by this war and thought that the only solution was to sue for peace because it's inevitable. Because if, you know, a, a, um, if a man such as myself, 55 years old, 83 kilos, uh, not in the best of shape, gets in the ring with Mike Tyson in his prime, I mean, we know how it's going to end, right? Yeah, that was pretty much uh, the, the, the situation insofar as the Ukraine and Russian conflict is concerned. And uh, perhaps I did not emphasize this enough in my videos, but the purpose of my videos was to point out how horrifying the war was, how detrimental to the Ukraine people and the Ukraine nation it was, and the, the only solution was to find a peace settlement of some sort, of any sort, to prevent the complete destruction of the Ukraine nation and the Ukraine people. Well, that happened. Uh, about a third of the population of Ukraine has left the country. 20% uh, of it is controlled and will be annexed by the Russians. And there's no doubt in my mind that they intend to capture much more territory of the Ukraine nation, probably up to the Dnieper River and take everything east of it. And that will include Odessa, of course. And uh, Ukraine will be broken. It's inevitable at this point, unfortunately. But anyway, the point that uh, I wanted to make is that last year I was detained. I was investigated to see if I was a Russian agent. They realized I wasn't. And uh, I was let go. But I was told in no uncertain terms that I could not leave the city or the country while my case was investigated. And me being a very law-abiding citizen, uh, because the extent of my criminal career up to this point was that in New York City in 2000, in the year 2000, I was living in lower Manhattan and I had a dog and I would walk the dog without a leash. And one time I got a ticket, $50, which I didn't pay. Uh, that's the extent of my law-breaking career. I'm very much a person who believes in civil society and following the rules and following the law. And so I was told that I couldn't leave the country, I couldn't leave the city even, which I wanted to because I wanted to be near my family. Um, and uh, so I was a good boy. <laughs> Later in prison, in, in CISO, I told this to some, uh, some of the other uh, prisoners there because they're not inmates because none of them have been convicted. Their cases are all being investigated. And some of these investigations take years, plural. Okay, One man I knew had been there for as he said very proudly, three years and three months. Another had been there six years. Because what they do is that they arrest you and charge you and uh, they start their investigation and they'll get around to the investigation when they get around to it. So a lot of times people just sit there forever. And uh, that's basically the justice system in Ukraine. So anyway, the point is that my case was expedited Prisoners couldn't believe that my case was uh, investigated in a month, exactly a month. By the 31st of May, they had completed their investigation of me being this uh, evil Russian propagandist. And the indictment was drawn up, which, as I said, you can read on, on Twitter and the thread that I posted at the same time that I'm posting this video. And uh, where was I? I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, when I was in prison and I told the other prisoners how I'd been detained in April of 22 and told in no uncertain terms not to leave the country, uh, the prisoners laughed and they said, you idiot. They were leaving the door open for you to leave. They wanted you to leave, you know, less hassle for them. And me, of course, you know, retrospectively, it's obvious, but at the time I said, no, I can't do anything. They're telling me to stay. So I must stay, you know, like a, like an idiot. That's simple as that. So anyway, insofar as my current, uh, 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 you know, status of being out on bail, and the, 
the judge was very clear that I could, I had to, I mean, it was very explicit. I couldn't leave the city. I couldn't leave the country. And I had to surrender my passports. I have two, the American and uh, Chilean. And, um, and of course, they also confiscated these documents for my transportation. And yet, when I was released on bail, uh, they gave me all this stuff back. They didn't put the electronic monitor and uh, they allowed me to keep my passports. And what's more, when I went to the SBU offices to retrieve my driver's license and my, um, my registration cards and my Chilean identity card, uh, they asked me, you know, and, and do, you, do you have any identification other than this stuff? Oh yeah, I have my passports. Oh, and you didn't surrender them? No, I have it right here, <laughs> I said, like an idiot. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay. And so these are the options that I have. Since I know I'm going to be found guilty and I will be sent to a prison labor camp. And because of events that happened in prison where I was extorted for a sizable amount of money, uh, I will be sent to a prison labor camp uh, come my court date. That's inevitable. Okay. And there won't be any suspended sentence and there won't be any mercy all because of my YouTube videos. I mean, I want to emphasize this, you know, in the indictment, if you read it, you will see that the prosecutor himself says that I committed no crime against any person or property and that my crimes are literally speech crimes, saying things that the government doesn't like. Mm -hmm. Ukraine is supposed to be this big democracy mm -hmm. that uh, it wants to join the European Union and ha because it has uh, European values. Dem uh, European democratic values. W what higher value does a democracy have than free speech? My case is all about free speech. And I spent, uh, you know, uh, two months and change in a maximum security prison. And by the way, when I say, okay, well, let me, let me finish that point. Uh, I spent two and a half, uh, two months and change in a maximum security prison over things that I said, opinions I gave regarding publicly available information that is undisputed. This is the epitome of free speech. And yet I went to prison for it and I will likely go five to eight years to a prison labor camp where by the way, everybody in the, the, the CISO prison, the investigative prison where I was at, none of them wanted to go to that labor camp because they all said it's a death sentence. Okay. And so I'm going to be sent for five to eight years because of YouTube videos that I made. Uh, uh, is that democratic? Does that sound like, um, you know, European values to you? Uh? Hmm. Sorry if this video is a little bit disorganized, you know, because I'm a little bit stressed out, but the choices I realize are two. Either go to a prison labor camp and die there. Because like I said, I'm 55. I have a heart condition. Uh, so as it is, I'm not going to live much longer. And five to eight years at a prison labor camp, uh, I'll be dead. I'll, I'll be killed off by the labor, I suppose. And if not, I will be killed um, on the inside because what happened while I was at CISO, I realized that the, um, uh, let me backtrack a little. While I was in CISO, I was extorted for a great deal of money, $70,000 to be precise. Now, how did this happen? Well, through various clues and various information that I acquired, which I intend to uh, uh, describe in detail in a book about the whole thing, if I live long enough to write that book. But anyway, the point is, I realized that once they arrested me on May 1st, the SBU, of course, confiscated my computers and um, they got into all of my accounts, which they hadn't done before. Because what had happened was that one of the computers, uh, I, had, I had left it in my motorcycle 
And uh, when they detained me that time, they hadn't realized that I had left it in my motorcycle because, you know, it has these, uh, I don't know if you can see them, it has these, uh, these suckers, right? And so, and that computer, that's my, that was my personal computer uh, with my personal, I mean, they're all personal computers, but I mean, with my personal information, including my accounts. And uh, while I was in prison, the SBU looked through my accounts and they realized that um, I'm not poor, okay? I, I, I don't want I, I to say, characterize it in any other way, but um, I have access to a lot of funds. Um, and the way I live is fairly simply and low key. I don't even own a car uh, because I was fortunate enough to earn a great deal of money as a writer when I was very, very young. And so I went through that phase of buying all the toys and all the crap that you really don't need to make your life happy. But I was young and I thought that I needed that crap. And so I bought it and then I realized, of course, it didn't make me particularly happy. And now as a much older and hopefully wiser man, I don't have any of that crap. I don't need it. And so the SBU had assumed that I was just some poor schmuck. But when they saw my accounts, they realized that I wasn't a poor schmuck. And so what happened was that they got the prisoners in CISO, in one of the four cells I was in, the last one, the worst one. Um, it was seven other prisoners and myself. And uh, as soon as I arrived, they, uh, they beat the shit out of me. And they tortured me uh, that time. It started on June 21st at 1 p.m. and it lasted 30 hours. It included beatings, it included sleep deprivation. Uh, you know, I've been beaten up, so it's not that big of a deal. I mean, it's not fun. <laughs> it hurts, yeah, sure. Uh, but you know, when I was young, you know, yeah, I got into street fights and crap like that. And sometimes I won and sometimes I got the shit kicked out of me. Mm -hmm. So the beatings I could handle, but when they started getting really, really pissed off at me because I kept insisting that I was just a journalist and I didn't have a pot to piss in and I had no money and I could not get them 70,000, uh, thinking that they'd lay off, thinking too and realizing too that extortionists, when you give in to them and you pay them, then they'll come back the next day and want more and they'll beat you some more for more money, right? And so, of course, I denied and denied the fact. I said I was just a poor writer, that I was living in Ukraine because it was so cheap and all the rest of it, you know. Poor me, I don't have a pot to piss in. Uh, but they knew, and they kept insisting, and a, and, and a very specific number, 70,000. And uh, what really unnerved me was that in the hour, maybe 25, 26, uh, two of these thugs held my head, and one of them used a toothpick to scratch the whites of my left eye. Um, and the other guy, the guy who actually spoke a little bit of English said, uh, you can read with just one eye, right? Uh, not gonna lie, that really freaked me out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, after about 30 hours of this, I realized that there was no escape for me. Uh, by the way, the guards, came in because they do a nightly check-in to see that everything's copacetic, you know? And the thing is, see, I saw that these guys had bribed those guards, bribed them with cigarettes and, and, and uh, other things because there's no money in, in the prison, but there are, you know, little perks, little this and that, knickknacks and whatnot. And so the guards who did the nightly check-in were on the take and they were in league with the, um, with the, uh, the, um, the gangsters, the thugs in, the, um, in my prison cell. And so I realized that this could last indefinitely. And so while I still had all my marbles, you know, because the sleep deprivation really affects you. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've just, <laughs> out of idle curiosity, because I'm that way, uh, a few years ago when I was living in Amsterdam, I tried to see how long I could go without any sleep. I went, uh, uh, I want to say like 60 hours. Uh, and um, I, I remember being surprised by the hallucinations with came, which came on around after 40 hours or so. And I thought they were pretty cool. But after about 60 hours, that's when I was just out of it. And, and, 
And it was just out of idle curiosity that I did it, because like I said, I'm kind of weird, you know? What, what the fuck can I say? Hmm? And so after um, 30 hours, yeah, I was hallucinating a little bit, you know? I was like uh, seeing writing on the, on the floor when there was none, of course, and little things like that, like little wormies moving around, you know? Uh, but anyway, the point is, the important point, I realized I'd have to give up the ghost because nobody was going to save me. And so I started negotiating and stretching out this uh, payment that I had to make. Uh, because, you see, my bank accounts, in order to make a transfer, you need uh, um, a little device that's a token that creates, that generates a number. So it's impossible to uh, transfer any money without that little token. And those tokens are apps in my uh, iPad and phone. And on top of that, because there's so much hacking going on from Ukraine, uh, my banks, uh, the websites to my banks to check um, certain accounts, the big ones, right? You can't access them from Ukraine. And my bank had to do special carve outs, specific IP addresses that are tied to specific locations. And that's why um, and those locations, of course, were far from Cecil Prison. That's why it was impossible for me to access those accounts, but it was possible for me to access a PayPal account that I had. Now, a PayPal account, um, it had quite a bit of money. It had $143,000 because it's just money that I've earned uh, on my Patreon. And it's great money, but I do the Patreon more for the ego trip and, and getting more subscribers as opposed to needing the money. And so the money had just accumulated. I was just sitting there. And uh, the SBU contacted these gangsters, probably through the prison guards at CISA, and figured out, or basically had the prisoners in the fourth cell that I was in do the actual dirty work of um, getting the money out of me. See? Because you see, the guards, they never beat any of the prisoners. No, it's the prisoners who beat the other prisoners. In fact, after this 30 hour session, one of the thugs who had really, really hurt me, I mean, he hit me pretty badly, especially on the chest. He, he hit me like right here on the sternum repetitively and so hard that it, had, it left this huge uh, 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 bruise. And by the way, the, the cell boss, the guy higher, berated him for having left a mark on me because of course, the kind of torture that they want to do doesn't leave a mark. That's the point of it. See, because if it leaves a mark, then it's evidence, you see? So anyway, um, that prisoner who beat me so relentlessly over that 30 hour stretch, after, you know, as we're, we're trying to figure out a way to get this cash to these gangsters, these thugs, he came to me spontaneously and apologized. Uh, you know, it wasn't his idea, but he had to do it, you know, because he was a prisoner. He'd been in, in, in CISO, in CISO prison for two years already. So, you know, it, it's not that he wanted to do this, but that he had to do it. And, you know, I understood, you know, because that's the way it operates. Now, I'm telling you all of this so that you understand my situation. My case originally started as a free speech issue. But because of the SBU and the inherent corruption of the SBU and the criminal justice system in Ukraine, I will definitely be sent to a prison labor camp where I will most certainly die. And so I decided that the smart thing was take my chances in terms of getting across the border Right now, I'm maybe five kilometers away from the border with Hungary. Uh, over the last two days, I rode my bike just about 1,300 kilometers from Kharkov all the way here to the border. And my intention is to cross the border, uh, get to Hungary, and in Hungary, I'm going to ask for political asylum. Now, why Hungary? And why ask for political asylum? Very simple. You see, when I don't show up at my court date on Wednesday, the day after tomorrow, 
there will be an arrest warrant issued for me. Now, of course, this arrest warrant, they will presume that I left the country, so it will become an international arrest warrant. Now, the European Union, which is allied with Ukraine to its perdition, as, as many of you know in terms of the European economy as well, the, the Europeans will comply with this international arrest warrant and they will scoop me up at the first chance. And it won't matter that it's a free speech case. It won't matter. Nothing will matter except complying. If I were to go to Poland or Slovenia or Romania, all of these little gremlins of the EU, they're going to scoop me up instantly and return me to the graces of the SBU and the criminal justice system. And eventually I'll wind up in a prison labor camp. I'm hoping that Hungary, which has shown some independence insofar as these matters are concerned, of complying with idiotic EU regulations and, and diktats, I'm hoping that the authorities in Hungary will look at my indictment, realize that it has nothing to do with me being an actual bona fide criminal in terms of harming people or, or property, and it's really a strictly free speech issue, an issue of democratic speech and i'm hoping that the hungarian authorities will show some mercy some and some understanding and grant me this political asylum um, that's my hope by the way i don't know anybody in, in in hungary i've been to budapest you know once for a long week and it was lovely but i don't know anybody in hungary i don't have any relations with hungarians of any sort um, I dated a Hungarian girl once uh, years ago, but other than that, I don't have any connection to Hungary, and so I'm really going to be throwing myself at their mercy, hoping that they will see through this bullshit and realize that it's grossly unfair and it is just uh, despicable. That's the only word I can think of. And so... Yeah, you know, um, that's my situation. And so as, I'm, as this video goes live, at the time that it goes live, I'm going to be crossing the border. And I'm going to be hoping that my name doesn't appear on any system and that I'll be allowed through. That's my hope. Uh, if my name is on some system, on some list that they have at the border, then I'll be arrested and um, it will be effectively a death sentence. And so I'm posting this video so that people know what happened to me if I really disappear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm certainly scared, sure, but fear doesn't really help the situation now, does it? You have to be clear. You have to be clear and you have to look at the options. And I've thought about this situation very, very carefully. And between the absolute certainty of going to a prison labor camp if I show up in court on Wednesday and the slim chance that I might be able to cross the border, I'll take my chances. Some people might think that, oh, why don't you just sneak across some empty field or something like that? That's laughable. Okay, but the obvious fact that, of course, if you sneak into Europe, you know, across some field, right? You know, later they're going to ask you, you know, well, how did you get into Europe? You know, uh, what's that all about? Where's your entry stamp? You know, um, I mean, it, it causes all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, I looked at the possibility, by the way. It's not as easy as you think. You think that it's just sneaking across some field. No, no, no. It's it's not. Okay. First of all, all the access points between one country and the other are monitored, okay? And very, fairly easy, they just have motion detectors. And if anything moves, then the cameras go on and they know exactly what's going on, okay? Uh, so that's not an option. As opposed to going to Russia, you know, Kharkov, after all, is 40 kilometers from Russia. It should have been easy, right? Well, no, because all that area is mined. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, both sides, though they're not fighting in that particular area, not yet, they know what's going on. You know, uh, they, they keep a close eye on that, on that crossing. 
So I'm, you can't go through there. Another option that I was seriously considering was going to the front, to going to the, the contact line and thinking to myself, maybe there is some spot in the contact line that is being used by civilians, refugees, going back and forth. Um, but that turned out to be a non-starter. I was surprised. I mean, the front is over a thousand kilometers long, but there is no real spot where you can easily move, not without a guide, not without somebody who knows what they're doing. I also looked into the possibility of somebody helping me out. And uh, a couple of them were grifters. It was clear as day, you know, they wanted money. Um, and the others, they had a lot of good intentions, but they didn't know what the hell they were doing. And so ultimately I was not able to find a Sherpa, a guide who could get me through. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my situation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm gonna chance it at the border. Mm -hmm. I'm posting this on both of my channels, the Roundtable and the Gonzalo Lira Again channel, which again, you know, it's weird because see, when they allowed me out on bail, see, last year, when they arrest, when they detained me, because they didn't formally arrest me, they detained me. Mm -hmm. When they detained me in April of 22, they took control of um, two of my Google accounts. The Google accounts that controlled my previous channels, my Coach Red Pill channel and my Gonzalo Lira channel. Um, and, um, you know, they, 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 never rescind, re, they never gave up that control of those accounts. I've never recovered those uh, Gmail accounts and, and Google accounts that control those channels. Uh, but the, the Google account that controlled my current channel, Gonzalo Lira again, and the Roundtable, they gave that back to me. Okay, so that further gives me the hope that they're just basically saying, go away. That's what I'm hoping. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, I realize what they did. Mm -hmm. And I've outlined it uh, to you in this video. And, um, you know, I don't know what to say. So, you know, you'll have to draw your own conclusions. Mm -hmm. By the way, during this past month that I've been free on bail, I obviously haven't been posting anything anywhere just to keep a low profile and just to straighten out my head as to my options. I didn't want to be distracted with social media. Mm -hmm. um, I reached out to a few uh, online people, but not all of the people that I know uh, from the online world not because of anything in particular, but just, you know, I wanted to get in touch with people who could, you know, help me out in a practical way insofar as this current situation is concerned. Uh, unfortunately, you know, all the avenues that I tried, it came to nothing. And so this is the, um, the situation I'm in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, um, well, look, On February 27th or 28th, I think it was the 20th, I'm not sure, I forgot. Uh, February 27th, 28th of 2010, I lived through the Great Chilean Earthquake. It was an 8.8 .8 earthquake. And I happened to be on the 15th floor. My apartment was on the 15th floor. And it was spectacular. My building moved around from side to side, you know, like three meters off axis, one way and a meter and a half roughly on the other end, this elliptical swinging around. And I thought that the building was going to collapse and I was going to die. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it didn't, thank goodness. But that was the moment that I learned fatalism. But there are some things that are simply beyond your control and you have to live through them. And you have to just go forward. And there's nothing you can do, everything is beyond your control. You know? And we, we you know, fool ourselves thinking that we can control everything. And uh, that causes so much anguish for no reason. We worry, we think this, that, the other, but you have to recognize when you have actual control over some situation and when that control is beyond you and there is absolutely nothing that you can do. Mm -hmm. Nothing that you can do except move forward. 
So either I will cross the border into Hungary in the next couple of hours, or I will be arrested again, and uh, God knows what will happen to me. So if I post again, here on the video and on Twitter, then you know that I made it. And if I don't, then you know that I didn't. And I would ask you humbly that uh, if you don't hear from me again, anybody and everybody who's watching this video, please ra raise a ruckus, raise a fuss. Because ultimately, you know, as you can see in the indictment that I uh, posted on Twitter, all of the pages are there. You can read it for yourself in Ukrainian and in English. The charges against me are just because of my opinion about this conflict. I did no harm to anyone. And they arrested me because they wanted to have they wanted to have on the nightly news a short little video of how they are fighting the propagandists. That's it. That's why they arrested me. Mm -hmm. The extortion stuff that I discussed, that happened later when they realized that I wasn't a poor schmuck. Mm -hmm. But the start of the genesis of this whole situation is because I had an opinion that went against the narrative. And that's why I went to prison. And that's why if I'm arrested again, I will die in prison. So I ask you, please, as many people as possible, the American State Department knows exactly who I am and the situation I'm currently involved in. And they know the fate that awaits me. They know it. You know, they have that saying that, uh, uh, that I, I forget the wording exactly. You know, I'm a little stressed out as you can imagine, but they have that saying that uh, uh, people are fundamentally good, but for evil to triumph, all you need is the uh, indifference of good people. Please don't be indifferent to my fate. I ask you this very humbly. Please recognize that well, uh, the literal death that awaits me if this is, it doesn't work out. Understand what's going on.